This is the Celtic Soul Podcast. I'm Andrew Millen, and you're all very welcome to episode number 55. My guest on the show today will be Charlie Feely, singer, songwriter, and the frontman of the legendary Glasgow Irish band, the Blarney Pilgrims. Born in Dundalk, but at the age of three, Glasgow became home, and that's where Charlie and his band would become part of the Celtic Match Day experience for so many travelling Celtic fans and so many locals. His music can still be heard blasting out on supporters' bus up and down the coast of Scotland as Celtic fans travel home and away and you'll always hear a Blarney Pilgrims tune if you're on an away days in Europe. This episode has been sponsored by The Boys, Celtic Ultras Group. Thanks very much to all the crew who bring so much life, noise and colour to away games and at Celtic Park, high up in the stands where the Jockstein meets the North Stand, Area 444. The boys are climbing Ben Lohman to raise funds for the Kana Foundation and they have a GoFundMe page set up and I'll have all the details in the podcast descriptions and I'll also have the boys' Insta page details if you want to follow them, see what they're up to. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club or Rich Uncle would like to sponsor the podcast, we would love them to sponsor to the podcast you can become a sponsor of an episode by emailing us at info at sallyfanzin.com and as always you can contact us through the website or on our social media pages if you're a listener or reader or both you can support our independent celtic media platform by visiting celticfanzine.com where you can become a member subscribe buy or donate for the price of a point your support will help us to continue to produce quality independent fan journalism fanzines podcasts video content and fan events and we are hoping that the vaccine can now become the game changer that gets us back to glasgow and back on the road fully in celtic next season Keep the comments and suggestions for guests coming in and let us know who you would like us to dig into their Celtic soul. Here's a few comments we received since the podcast last week. Best podcast yet, mate. Great stuff. And that comes in from Rob Millen, who wouldn't be biased, but he is me nephew. Quality interview, Millish. Comes across as a top lad you could sit and have a point with. His documentary is tops and knowledge of football is impressive. And that comes in from Barry on Twitter in Dublin. Have to say, just listening to this impressive Johnny Own chat was filled with pure pride that Celtic Art Club brings so much joy to all people. Another great, great chat. Gutted when it was over, I could have listened all day. Thanks so much, Millish. And that comes in from Mick Scanlon in Dublin. Mick, thank you so much. I see you. Give us a donation. Much appreciate the support. Andrew, I've listened to all your podcasts now and they truly are very enjoyable. So many shy podcasts out there, but yours is a treat. The quality of guests are top draw. Keep them coming. I've signed up for a 12-month membership today. It's fantastic what you're doing. And that comes in from Cal Biggins Slater on Twitter. And I have to say, a quality handle to have on Twitter. Thank you very much. What a listen. Really enjoyed this. Just what I needed right now. Cheered me up no end. Just need to watch the documentary now. That comes in from Ken Walsh. Most enjoyable podcast, fascinating insight into three legends of the game, Matt Busby, Jock Steen and Bill Shankly. And what it was like grow up supporting Celtic in Ireland and memories of Matt and O'Neill and Robbo. Also, the sponsors of the Johnny Young podcast were very impressive. And that comes in from the sponsors, Tony Ratton and the boys in Sunderland. Again, boys, thanks very much for sponsoring the podcast. Celtic Soul podcast, another cracker of an episode. Keep up the fantastic work, gets us through this madness. Hail, hail, Mark McCabe. That comes in from Mark based in Glasgow but a dub and again another Sunday morning run with the Celtic Soul podcast for company great listen for us Celtic Daz good man Rory us Celtic stars we have to stick together and we're still getting a great response to David Potter's long read his one this week was or last week was Paddy Crerant and we put it up on a Saturday morning folks so if you're looking for something decent to read at the weekend I can recommend David's long read after Charlie Tully Paddy became my favourite player I cried when he left and since then I have never shed a tear when anyone else left I have been sad but no tears at primary school I wrote a poem about Paddy Paddy Craren, the pride of Parkhead. He's good with his feet, he's good with his head. At Roy Half a Master, great on the ball. Can dribble round Miller Brand and them all. And that comes in from Tommy Stephen. Tommy, I hope you're well. It's great to have some feedback from you and I hope you're enjoying the podcast as well as, as what we're sticking up on the website. Tommy will be well known for holding court outside the pool's office with Charlie McGinley and John Fallon on match days. I miss those wise old Celtic granddad chats. Back to the podcast feedback. Have 
have to say that was one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've listened in a while. Obviously, great set of content with Steen, but great listening about the vibe and scene that was going on when we were going to matches in our teens. I actually met Johnny a couple of times in Dublin and Cardiff back in the day. Great listen, Jason Maloney. Great to hear Jason. Jason was the editor of the Shamrock Rovers fanzine, the Glen Malore Gazette. So high praise indeed for Jason to get. And I know that they would have swapped fanzines with the Merthyr Tivill boys. Dial M for Merthyr, I think was the name of the fanzine. Just finished the pod. Aye, that was a good one. He's a good talker and seems a good guy. And that comes up with Mick Kane, Mix of Journalists in Glasgow. And Mick writes for us, wrote a review for the website of the documentary. And that kicked off uh, how we ended up getting Johnny on the podcast. So Mick, thanks very much. Listen to most of the podcast today. It was brilliant. Watching Three Kings just now. It's amazing. And that comes in from another one of our writers, Liam Kelly, down in Bournemouth. Absolutely brilliant pod with Johnny Owen. And that's from Kevin McCluskey in Glasgow. Folks, thanks very much for all the comments. And I'll just finish off on a comment about the, the latest issue with the fans in. Quality reading throughout, namely the article on Danny McGrain, the thought-provoking editorial, the sense of reading, that is the John Fallon column, the interesting insight into Willie Maley, the excellent Celtic for life, not just for a season piece by the classic Kieran Kenny, the Henry Glassman piece by Martin Donaldson brought back memories, Owen Coyne's far-troy views on the restructure of the club and the brutally honest 10 given so easily and delivered by Rachel Lynch. The magnificent must-read Neil Lennon's time may be up, but he deserves respect piece from Paddy McMenamin and the beautiful poem about the quadruple treble by the fantastic Aaron Boyle. And that comes in from Tony Ratton again in Sunderland. Tony, thank you so much. And it's it's amazing. We've been doing the fans in for 20 years and Tony only heard of us through the podcast, which we started in May. So and started to subscribe to us and support us. So, uh, as always, Tony, thank you so much. Folks, keep the comments, bribes and donations coming in. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a couple of days since news officially broke that Neil Lennon had resigned as Celtic manager. After the story was leaked to the tabloids the night before, and then we had wall-to-wall coverage of his departure within the mainstream media, the click sites and the Celtic fan sites. Sky Sports News lined up a number of ex-players and podcast hosts to discuss the Lennon departure while John Hartson was the guest on the football show to give his thoughts on his former teammates departure but I think after 12 hours of it I think we were all done and dusted and we move on now by now most of the websites will have written about the departure and the debate will have started and will have finished in some quarters but the big debate now is who's going to replace him we're going to have so much chit chat conversations with very little substance, the new management fakes the Celtic will get plenty of tabloid inch columns between now and when the position is finally filled. We're going to have constant rumours and half-truths and you know it's going to be a bit like when we're linked with all these players in and out of the club during the transfer window. Social media is where most fans would have turned to when Lennon's resignation was announced and even in his departure, Lenny managed to split the supporters' opinion Many wished him well and remembered the massive amount of success he's had at the club as a player and a manager. But others, his tenure this season is just unforgivable and failing to win 10 in a row will, I suppose, never be forgiven by some. The club now needs a complete rebuild from top to bottom. We're still drunk on success of the nine and the quadruple treble. Kills me to say it, but the Rangers borrowed and once again put all their eggs in one basket. They may be on the brink of bankruptcy, but they've stopped the 10 and... They are doing well domestically and in Europe, while we have gone into reverse like a high-speed train. A conversation has to now take place with Scottish rugby about incoming CEO Dominic McKay to get him in before July, when he's supposed to officially take over. Peter Lowell needs to go on guard and leave, because the clear-out has started and it's going to continue. That will include members of the board, our head of recruitment and some of the coaching staff and a large chunk of the current playing squad who have failed miserably this season to even challenge for the title. But all this upheaval will not help during the summer, with European campaigns kicking off in midsummer, with a backdrop of uncertainty and how and when the fans will return. The whole season hangs now on season book sales for the club. We need stability at the club. We need this man to come in now to start putting everything in place for next season. We're going to have to wait, it looks like, till after the Euros, maybe, for the announcement of a manager, coaching team, or even a director of football, which seems to be the inward. That leads me to the Celtic PR and media team, who have been so poor this season in communicating with fans about the failures on and off the park. Now's the time to reverse that and start meaningful communication with the Celtic support. Tell us what the plan is, 
what the plan is about the rebuild of our great club, the time scale of this rebuild. Celtic must become the dominant club again in Scotland and they must show us there is a blueprint for progression in Europe and a plan to develop young players, which has always been at the heart of Celtic's core structure since Jock Steen's rebuilding of the club in the 60s. Now we need Dermot Desmond to return from his exile and show that he is the club's future at the forefront of all his thoughts, starting by getting the new CEO in now, get Peter out on guard and leave, as I've said, let him officially retire from the Celtic hostie in June, but the clock is ticking and time is not on our side. We need to rebuild the brand, the name, the team. My guest on today's podcast is Charlie Feely, singer, songwriter and frontman of legendary Glasgow Irish band The Blaney Pilgrims. Born on Dundalk, it was Glasgow where Charlie and his band would become part of the Celtic matchday experience for so many Celtic fans and his music can be heard blasting out of supporters' buses up and down the coast of Scotland and on European away days. Hi Charlie, you're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. It's been a long time since I heard The Blanche perform. But thanks to Spotify, you're back in my kitchen on a regular basis on a Saturday night with those wonderful lyrics and music from my favourite Celtic album, Grandma Was a Celtic Man. So, Charlie, the first question is, where have you been? Where did you disappear to? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's really nice being here. And uh, I haven't disappeared. It's everybody else has disappeared. <laughs> no, we, we've been in... Uh, Myself and Louise have been living in Kerry now for nearly 20 years, been in uh, Barry Ferreter in West Kerry, and uh, uh, which is a million miles away from Glasgow, really. <laughs> so it's the quiet life. Very much. It's uh, walking, reading, listening to the Irish language all the time. Not speaking it, but hearing it. <laughs> Not learning it, but listening to it. And uh, playing a wee bit of music. Myself and Louise uh, have a wee duo called The Coolies. And we've been play, we've played in all over the Dingle Peninsula and uh, singing songs of a somewhat different nature to the ones we played before. So, as you say, the quiet life... Walking, listening to the Irish language. What a wonderful list to listen to. I want you to tell me the next one I'm talking to you that you've picked up a few words and you're, and you're conversing now in, in our native tongue. <laughs> well, that's why I said I was listening to the Irish language. I didn't say I was speaking it, you know. But my mother, my mother was uh, from uh, Northbridge outside Dundalk and her father had been a farm labourer and... Uh, she had a country accent and she never lost it at all in Glasgow. But when Glaswegians came to the door to fix the corporation house and they spoke in Glaswegian and they'd say, Oh, you're here, this has been gone, go, go, fix your thing. You know I mean? My mother understood every word, but she couldn't imitate a Glaswegian to save herself. So I can kind of hear it, but not speak it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a it's a far cry from Glasgow, right, <laughs> where you're living now. But you made the decision 20 years ago to to come back home because originally, Charlie, as I said, you you're, you're from Dundalk, but you made you made Glasgow your home. And while in Glasgow, as I said earlier, you farmed the the Blaney Pilgrims with, with Louise played in, and there was two iconic albums: Grandma Was a Celtic Man" and "Marching Down Sackville Street," which was recorded live here in Dublin. At the Main Fiddler, Charlie, two very different albums. One a protest album about war and peace, and one about what it is to be a Celtic fan and to hear about the history of a great club. And I suppose it's written through the eyes of fans from many decades and generations of Celtic supporters, which is kind of unusual to the normal Celtic songs we hear or our Celtic albums. And if, if I could give you a compliment on the Grand Was a Celtic Man album, which, is, as I said, is, is now available in, on Spotify on Back in My Kitchen, because I don't know where the CD is gone, all the tapes. I'm sure they were left on a bus somewhere. But I would describe the album and the way it was, it was written and performed as a thing of beauty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Because, it, it's, like, as I said, it's written through, it goes back, you know, Waterfront, the Sympali fans, Paddy and me, you know, in 
No, it always makes you think of friends that are in America and watching the games in America and the perfect world. When Saturday comes, it's, you know, it's always been sad for me. They just, they just tell the journey that, that maybe I was on. Yes, yes. I, 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 you see, that album was a lot to do with the 90s and uh, things had changed. And I was thinking about it today when I was out walking along the beach and I was thinking about um, it was the hunger strikes. It was 1981. You had Belfast, you had Dublin and you had Glasgow. The 70s in Ireland were just a short time. They, they, they were just a couple of years before the hunger strikes. You had Ireland, the, the free state, if you like, for the 26 counties up still under the control of the church. Uh, not being supportive of the North. The hunger strikes changed everything. They changed everything in Glasgow. They divided. They asked the question, do you support this or do you not? And like-minded people need to find each other. And it was obvious to me that the, the, the people in the North needed a friend and they, well, they have to visit their friends and the only friends they could visit really was Glasgow. A working class Irish community. They couldn't go to the South in the same way. They formed a relationship with Glasgow. And then, after the hunger strikes, I believe we witnessed the people, the youngsters from, in, in, in the Free State, saying we're part of that too, we believe in that too. And they started going to Glasgow. Where else would you go? So if you went to Glasgow, you met like-minded, you met like-minded people from London, from Dublin, from Glasgow. You met them all, and Celtic was the, the kind of gel, in a way. So that period in the 90s, it was all about the fans, and it was all about the people. It always, I mean, it always was. So I just thought, I witnessed that, and all the people starting to come from uh, the south. Uh, the, it's, but it's very difficult talking about these two islands, isn't it? When you've got a free state, a south, a republic, a north, a south, a Great Britain, a UK, and what have you. But the, the people coming from Dublin and Tipperary and all of that, it was fantastic. And we all formed a comradeship at that time. It was like Dublin, Belfast, Derry, Glasgow, meeting in a common play, a common way. That's, that's the way it felt to me. And also, we had all been oppressed and all held back in our Irishness, even in Ireland. And it was a kind of a, a awakening. And I think uh, the music and uh, like going to Glasgow if you're a Celtic supporter and travelling over, it would either not only meeting people, you could have a really, really good time you know, for a few for a few <laughs> it's like, that, you could have a really, really good time, you know. And so, I mean, if it was, if it, nobody wants to go somewhere and watch 90 minutes of football and then turn around and come home, you know. And uh, I think there was an awful lot of fun, but there was a great camaraderie and that was evident. Uh, and I know, like, Maeve Podrig and yourselves and all that and the league and everything and everybody, everybody knew everybody, didn't they, you know? There was certainly a great... Um camaraderie and friendship struck up on buses and boats and you sing about you sing about her in um, 200 miles from home and like that song I think it's six minutes long Charlie and we played it we played um, I think we played it on one of the podcasts but, and you know Friday the podcast goes out Friday but by Saturday a lot of the lads have listened to her and Saturday night like then in the group chats you know, <laughs> The Blarneys was was being discussed, and I had discussed about having you on the podcast and um, previously, and then this kind of this, I got another song off Mark, and we played out with that, and the reaction was great. And I went, well, maybe it's time that we 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 <laughs> walked Charlie up there and Kerry and got him to come onto the podcast and speak about <laughs> his memories because, like. As you say, it's not just about 90 minutes and we, I suppose we call the fans in more than Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Be because it is it's it is so much more. And I always say, when people used to come on the bus for the first time, 
if they did, they either got her or they didn't within that day. You know, like, <laughs> got off that bus, I would have said, right. Never again. I'm like, oh, That's right. Right. Well, That's other, right. other lads got on that bus and girls. And, yes. You know, if that bus was to leave Drada tomorrow or to Dulik or Dublin, Derry or Belfast, you know, these people would be on it. And I, I, I do maintain it, you know, you get it the first day or you don't get it. Yeah, exactly. You either go, this is smashing, this is great fun, fun. I like who I'm with, it's good. Uh, it, and and, and it, it, it is fantastic sharing that. And it's like the song I, I did was the, um, what was it? So, always be Celtic with me, is that it? It's always, it's always been Celtic with me. But the verse begins with, uh, from the cradle to the grave, life is tough. From the beginning to the end, the road is rough. But there's something you should always keep in mind. Take comfort in what comfort you can find. And if that comforts Celtic or a, a cheese and onion sandwich or the opera or anything, it doesn't matter. And it says it is only a diversion, it is only a hobby. But if you didn't have delights and diversions and hobbies and loves and all that, where would we be, you know? I think, uh, PC, there was a time when the players kind of lived the same lives as we did. They don't anymore. So at that time, even when I was writing the songs, they had to be about the fans. And it's funny, I don't even really like the word fans because, like, Fans is like a Herman's Hermits fan, you know, like uh, it's a, it, it should it should be supporters. I you turn up and you support your team, yeah. But uh, um, uh, but it's it's the it's the support. I say it's the fans. I fell in love with more than anything. Charlie, I mentioned, you know, like we can hear your voice on many a bus trip um, through, through, you know, up the coast of Scotland, if you head from Glasgow to Aberdeen. And some of these buses are all buses and they still have tapes and there is still, still some tapes out there. But our journey from, a personal journey from, you know, Dulik into Drada and then, and then up, up along the coast. But when we were running the buses and over to Glasgow, it wasn't just music we heard. Someone, someone might put a video on and then the storytelling, especially by all the fans on the boat. Yes, I suppose yes. Kenny, when, when I had him on the podcast, to hear the stories about the cattle boats and the cattle yes. off before the Celtic fan, you would mm. never get that storytelling and them days back because some of these older guys have now passed away or are, are, are unwell and wouldn't be fit enough to do the traveling. So I feel as I come up to 50 years now of age that, like, you know, those younger years, and especially through my 20s, what I learned and it does form, you know, them bus trips can form your opinion and I can swing your opinion coming up to an election. Or- there's, no question, there's no question about it. You see, one of the things is Glasgow is a real working class city. It's... Red Clyde side, it's socialism, it's red flags, it's trade unions, it's meetings and halls upstairs, it always was. In Ireland, there was no advanced working class in the sense that there was no huge mining, no huge industry. Uh, So you never had generations of uh, organised labour, really, you know. And... uh, it's such a breath of fresh, and the church in this country was so anti-socialist, anti-communist, and all that. Anti, they were forming their own organisations all the time to stop people forming secular organisations and unions and what have you. So, also, I think people like yourselves who went to Glasgow heard things being said, you know, and an attitude uh, being expressed that, that you felt. You know, uh, um, like I find here, like for example, in living here, that in Glasgow we knew there was a social, uh, uh, there was a, a social services. We expected a council house. We expected uh, uh, to be in a trade union. We expected free health. We expected doctors to come out during the night. We it was understood you could support your own class and everything. And I, I, I think. There was a broadening of experience for people both ways, you know, every way, um, going back back and forth. I don't know if you understand or if you, if you think there's anything in what I'm saying, but it was a, it's a really good working class city, isn't it? I mean, he, he, yeah, but is that um, you had the NHS? We have a health, we have a two tier health system that is for that favours the rich. So I, I can understand fully where you come from because growing up 
you know, the Catholic Church was 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 a big was a, had a big say when I was a child. You know, it doesn't have to say now, but the parties that that were around then, the political classes, the political elite, they still run the country. We've never had a you know, we've never had a left wing option. No, in this country. The thing is, see, uh, people who are uh, for one or better. Friends, Irish Catholics in, in, in Glasgow, right? It was very wonderful to be an Irish Catholic and live in a country where the Catholic Church didn't call the shots. That was a most refreshing thing, you know. Um, so they, 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 they could try and tell you everything, but they didn't run the country. But here, here they did, didn't they? We're getting very serious, aren't we? <laughs> yes, exactly. So the Irish in Britain, in Scotland and Glasgow, um, unlike in Ireland, they were living in a country where the Catholic Church did not run the show, did not call the shots. So um, that, I, I must say, was a most refreshing thing, you know, to, to, to be the whole thing about contraception, the whole thing about health, the whole thing didn't need to go to mass. I mean, here in my parents, even in the fifties and sixties, you lose your job. Just, just stand against the uh, orthodoxy would really put you at risk, wouldn't it? You know, uh, if you didn't go to mass, if you lived, uh, you weren't married, if you had children out of wedlock, if you proclaimed yourself as a champion of the workers' causes or something like that, you would be even you, 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 your, your, your career if you had one would be over. You know. It was very difficult in those days to speak against the orthodoxy, wasn't it? That brings me now back to, you know, you were born in Dundalk. How, how long did you live in Dundalk before Glasgow? I left Dundalk before I was three. I let, uh, my father had, uh, he was from Bally Bay in Monaghan, and he had moved to Dundalk as a young boy, like 11, 12, 13. Met my mother and then, uh, um, so my older sister and myself were born in Dundalk. And, uh, Obviously, well, my father had the TB in those days in Ireland and TB, you could forget about work, you know, you could, so they had to leave. And I remember asking my father years ago, I was watching the television as a young boy and there was a program about the Irish in San Francisco. And it was the first time I realised there were Irish people other than in Ireland and Glasgow. And I asked him why... Uh, why didn't we go to San Francisco? Uh, and he, he said that uh, it cost something like £40 to get to San Francisco and £10 to get to London and £6 to get to Glasgow. <laughs> so I've always thought the cream, of the, the cream of the Irish race did not find, find their way to Glasgow. But the other thing was, my father had a brother in uh, Glasgow. He'd, he'd left just a short while before. Uncle Jerry, and Uncle Jerry was working in Glasgow, and he was uh, he had a great job. He was a really big, big, fancy job. He was a lamplighter for the corporation. He went around uh, with a wee ladder, turning on all the lights and the closest the wee gas lamps. Uh, so my father must have been really <laughs> impressed by uh, Jerry's achievements. So off we headed to Glasgow. And about six months after we arrived in the Globals, Jerry fucked off back to Ireland and became a journalist in the Dundalk Democrat. <laughs> so we stayed in Glasgow. Uh, no, uh, in the Globals as well, in St. Francis Parish in the Globals. Uh, uh, it was like, uh, if you were asking where most Irish were in Scotland, uh, concentration would be Glasgow. And then he said, what area you'd say the Globals. And then he said, what parish you'd say St. Francis, you know? That's where I grew up anyway, in the Globals. So you wouldn't have many memories of Dundalk, but so the Globals was was home. Yes, of course, we went we went home to Dundalk uh, every year in the summer and all that, spent summers there and that kind of thing, of course. But uh, it, was, it was the Globals, yes, that was my formative years. You're in the Globals. You know, as you say, the heart of the Irish community in Glasgow and St Francis, the heart of the Irish community in the <laughs> Gobbles. You know, without, without going into your house. But there's a backdrop of, um, it's a working class city, we all know that. And then there's, there's musical influences and there's political influences. We are always aware 
of your of your Irishness. There, 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 you see, this is a thing. Uh, my earliest memory is myself and my mother, and uh, it may have been Long Street. I actually remember the street, but I was a wee boy, and the way your mommy takes you to the side of the road to have a pee and pulls down your pants and all that, you know. And she was leaning over me, and next thing these stones started bouncing off my mother's back. And these boys, who they could have been 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, I was too young to work it out, but they started shouting because they, they, they heard the accents and they were telling us to uh, fuck off back to Ireland, you Irish pigs. And this was in the globals. I wonder how uh, they've been in big things, you know what I mean? Uh, so... Um, because it was the heart of the Irish community, it was still a, it was a petrified heart at that time in the sixties. I believe when the Irish went the first time, you know, I mean, at the time Celtic and Finland and such like, when they went to Glasgow, I believe they were strong and confident and uh, proud and. Uh, ready to stand their ground. But something happened, maybe after the Second World War or something, I don't know, where the Irish community hid and kind of tried to integrate a bit, you know, and uh, being Irish was an embarrassment. To have an Irish name was was an embarrassment. Irish people were an embarrassment. uh, that was the kind of feeling, the, the whole colonial thing. You know, when I was growing up and you felt very small and vulnerable, that's why I remember the first Celtic match I ever went to, I was about eight, nine or eight or nine in 64, I think it was about. And a friend of my father's, Con Gillespie from Donegal, who was also a tailor like my father, uh, took me to see Celtic playing in the first Cities Cup. And it was uh, a team from Portugal whose name I could not say then and whose name I could not say now. So we, there, was, there was an X in it. And so I always called it Leox's, but I think it's Leox or something. I don't know, right? And that was the first match I went to. And I remember climbing up the stairs and the floodlights on the, gra- the, the, the ground and the green. And I remember all the people in the Irish flags. And that's the wee bit on Saturday comes around, you know, like the floodlight shining in the Glasgow dark. And when the crowd all sang a lot, I sang a lot. I was a wee boy. But what happened was, I knew when I saw that, that I wasn't alone. But it wasn't a wee ghetto. I knew that there was a place in, in Scotland where Irish people uh, that took, their, took their place, were proud. This stadium was a magnificent, you know, thing. It was wonderful to see a place where there was no anti-Irish bigotry, you know. Uh, so I admit that, that I, and I think even though I was raised in Glasgow and in Gorbals, I, I am. Um, I I was born many miles from you, many for the blue. Twenty-five, Charlie. Because this is who I am. Yes, I am both, but I really I am. I I am from the dock, right? And so I I wasn't raised in Glasgow. I didn't have grandparents, parents, uncles who supported Celtic and all that. To me, I I was an I, I, I doesn't matter. I was an Irish boy in Glasgow, and when I saw Celtic Park for the first time, it had an enormous impact on me. And I'm sure it's the exact same thing happened to you. You know. <laughs> I think Charlie's yours is probably different because I grew up in, in in a big estate where life was great. Everybody was the same. Like if we saw someone from a different culture or background, it might have been a doctor or it might have been when you went to the hospital, you know. And we were probably when you when you spoke earlier on about the hunger strike in eighty one, that was probably the first time I was asking questions. I was probably eight or nine, ten maybe, and um, I remember. Um, People walking through the streets of the estate having um, vigils and yes. tor- torches being lit. 
And I remember asking an older brother, and I was quite good at, at swimming. And I remember the school took us to, because there was no swimming pool then. I don't think in Drada. So the school, I, I don't. I used to go to. No, we we, we actually learned to swim. In, in, it was a private college out the road, and a couple of local women used to bring us on a bus, and we learned to swim from when we were very young. Every Friday, you know, your man brought you to the bus, paid a couple of quid, and we learned to swim. But it was funny. We had a swimming team in the school, but we no swimming pool. But we, we got brought to Tala. Um, to, they had, there was a big swim pool up there, and we got brought to Tala. And I remember on the bus seeing all the posters of all the hunger strikes mm. on the pole because obviously mm. there, there was an election coming up, and you know, there was it was hunger strikers were running in the south in the elections, but there was also you know posters up to support them and show all of them that was on hunger strike. So that was the first time I it was no anti Irish is where I grew up, you know. Of course not, of course not. For you to see that stadium would be a totally different experience. Yes, yes, yeah, right. Yes. It was uh you realize uh the if you really really did realize you were not alone. You know. yeah, and, and one thing I pick out of what you said was you said you saw the tricolour and it's funny the first time I went I was in the main stand and I looked across and I saw the tricolour that was kind of like you know I, you know, I was like a colleague but then Charlie when, when, when you when you when I started going to pubs in Glasgow be it down the Gallagher or over to the Gobbles or you know because there was no there was no certainly pubs in the in the, in the city centre <laughs> We gradually got the plastic Irish pubs. When I bring people over now, you know, kind of casual fans are coming over for a weekend. They're shocked. They they they, they think this has always been here. And I go, no, 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 no. It's a, you know, music would have been only played in in certain areas <laughs> because it would have been, you know, looked down and and it was still a huge. Um, you've left twenty years ago, right? In them twenty years, it's amazing how the city has developed. <laughs> And Irish music has played such a big part. So for you, it must be, you must be, when you start playing music first, there must have been certain venues you could play, and that was it. This is what happened. This is the story. Me and my pal, Michael, right? We liked music, and uh, we didn't like working. And uh, (laughs) so I remember reading the... uh, Look, Kelly said that his whole ambition, aspiration in life was to earn the same as a worker, but play music instead of being a wage slave, right? So I thought, I think I'd rather do that as well. You know, not trying to be a star, but just if I can get the same as the plumber or the bus driver, right, that that would do, right? And only I won't have to work. And me and Michael uh, got together, so... Of course, we thought, well, there's Irish bars and well, we were in Glasgow, there only was two types of bars, so we had to play in, we had to play in Irish bars. Now, so we began with the usual folk repertoire, you know, um, the, the kind of Irish ballads and, and all of that, and aspirations to be Christy Moore and all this stuff, and uh, Planksty, and we did about 10 instruments each, we thought, that, and we couldn't play any of them, but we, we threw, <laughs> <laughs> We're fucking what, right? But anyway, so we had our very first gig, and it was they were putting a hat round uh, the revolutionary communist party had heard that we were uh, quite uh, radical, so uh, so they asked would we come and play at a gig, and uh, and they would put the hat round and Bruce Morton, do you know him, the ex Scottish comedian? Anyway, he was there. He, he was starting off. I remember he played, but me and Michael, and we called ourselves the Merry Toyboys. We should have been called the Depressing Toyboys. The two of us, <laughs> we were absolutely terrible, and we were we didn't even smile once. But that that but anyway, we started playing, and then we noticed that we were playing in bars, and he'd be singing about Colonial Boy, or he'd be singing, you know, something. Uh, Innocuous, and people were coming up to you and saying, "I ditch that fucking uh, bebel shite." You know, um, that's sectarian. You can't play that. This is a mixed pub. Things like that. So me and Michael were sitting talking, and now it should be said, now which is very interesting, but people might not know. Michael wasn't brought up in the one true faith. 
there wasn't a, a, a Michael was brought up a, on the Protestant side, and me and Michael were talking, and Michael says, if we're going to get home for a sheep, let's get home for a lamb. Right? Well, no, is it a lamb for a sheep? <laughs> if we're going, right, anyway. And the two of us decided there and then we would sing nothing but Republican music from start to finish and the strongest type we could get our hands on, right? Because unless you did that and got that question out of the way, you, you wouldn't be able to bring Seamus Ennis and Willie Clancy and all that into the equation, right? If, if you were going to get, because we said, what was it, if you're going to get your head kicked in for the Wild Rover, you might as well get it kicked in for Cross McGlynn. So we just, so we decided we would just start from the beginning and we decided to do the very first song as hard as we could right through to the end. With, in the old days, they used to have diversions, you know, sing a wee ballad, sing a wee Celtic song, sing a wee this, sing a wee that. We just went, oh, fuck that, and just sang rebel music from the first song to the last. Celtic weren't allowed in and either. There was more important things in Celtic than with our and you know. So we, 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 we just did rebel music all the way. And, uh, and what we noticed is once we started doing that, people started showing great respect. And weren't so cheeky anymore, and they didn't fall me into the toilets and suggest you did it. They were frightened of you, you know. Um, so so that, that was very liberating. But the war was on then, militias, you know, and there was a real point. And as Jerry O'Glack and the Irish Brigade said to me a couple of years ago, came down and they were to the visit and they were having a drink, and he said, somebody had to beat the big drum. It was agitprop, it was, uh, it, was, it was a war on, you know, and... That was it, you know. It's funny, Charlie, like when you say about the war on and, and rebel songs and that, people hear a rebel song in, in, in their teenage years and some of them will say, you know, they'll hear the story in the song and they may go and read a book about that. So, like, Jerry's completely right because, you know, like these stories which were told in the song are, are very important and, and it must have been very important for people who were involved uh, or people who, who's, whose family were in prison or to, to think that the story was being shared. And some of the, you know, some of the songs you sing are very historical, you know, the from over a hundred years ago, and right up, right up to up to peace times here, Charlie. So it's it's uh, it's interesting you say that, that you know you weren't getting followed to the toilets anymore because you, <laughs> you and Michael, who was a Protestant from the Protestant faith, had just made the decision. Right, basically said, "Fuck this." But who were the influences? You know, you mentioned Luke Kelly there, Christy Moore. Who who was your influence when you were growing up? Well, first of all, my music uh, musical influences are who I listened to were. No, Irish, you know. Everybody had a couple of albums of rebel songs in the house and they all loved them. They got them in the bars, just like always. But uh, for me, um, who I listen to, and see, who, 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 who you listen to and who you... It's, it's kind of diff- but with me, it was always Bob Dylan and Loud and Mainwright and uh, Leonard Cohen and... Uh, um, the band and uh, there was uh, there was no there was uh, you see there was no Irish Irish tradition there's Irish traditional music of course which is wonderful and I, I play the island pipes and I play the whistle and I play jigs and reels and that for myself always have and I love it and I, I really do love it you know but the singing of the songs with my guitar only began with the Clancy Brothers. And that came from Greenwich Village in New York. This is an American, this is an American folk revival. This, this taking off the foggy Jew or anything and strumming a guitar and singing is a 60s, late 50s, 60s folk revival from America. And Luke Kelly introduced the Scottish and English folk revival through his relationship with Ewan McCall and all that. There was no Irish ballad tradition of playing a guitar. The Irish song was sung on a company, or there was a piano like Count John McCormick and you know the tenors, right? So the only real the source of all this music really is American. If you if you know you know you have a different accent, you have different subject matter, but it, it, it's a very recent modern thing. I mean, the Irish you listen to Irish 
traditional music and singing doesn't even have harmony. You know what I mean? Everybody just sings in unison, they just sing the same notes. So uh, we think, I think, a lot of times we're listening to Irish music. It's the same as they talk about when you talk about moving hearts. But if you listen to um, uh, Fairport Convention in the early days, they did all the rock, Celtic uh, things already. It was all done, you know. We, we, the Irish, we are great at taking things from other cultures and making really good use of them, you know. Uh, but we, we, we shouldn't kind of get confused and think that we made it up, if you follow me, you know. Uh, 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 so that, so what it is, is there's a love of music and then I was always political and then I understood that it was really, really important to me that the Irish in Glasgow or a, a, a Taking a back seat, really, really important, you know. And you, you then would bring that um, music to the Marching Down Sackville Street album because obviously Woody Goodrich, <laughs> this land. I think yeah, you've done an arrangement <laughs> one, one other of the songs, and then Trouble's Lullaby is there, yeah. Trouble's Lullaby is there, is there. And then John and there's, also, there's also there's a John Lennon song. Yes, yes. So you, you you've carried your influences um, right through from them early days of, of the two piece. Now, here's something, right? We spoke about influence now. The Glasgow sound is completely different from, from the Irish sound. The bands are different. They may play the same same songs, but the band is different. You know, with the introduction of the bass and the drums, I always found, you know, there was a raw or sound. There was, I had the, you know, I had a pair of balls like punk rock and... Uh, <laughs> And then it was it was fused with traditional instruments, you know, the, yes. with the blannies you, you had, you know, mandolin and uh, whistle, uh, some of the bands of whistles, accordion. Yeah. And like, and I, I look back to one of my favourite bands, and I look back to you know the London Irish and uh, the sound the Pogues created. You know, they ripped up the Cayley music rule, of course, and, of and, course, and gave it the power and, and the, yes. the energy of punk. So, is that where the, where did the sound that the blannies created? And that Glasgow sound, where does that come from? Well, I see, I can only speak for our music. I say it comes from two places. Um, the first place it the first place it comes from is um, you see, comes from Republican flute bands and the drums, right? So a ballad group typically would go like, oh father, man, the new song, sad and the spinster man, but that if you try to march to that, you'd end up in the ditch, right? So that kind of thing, right? So you slow it down and you let the swagger come in, which is very important. You know the way the flute bands, the, the gallus, there's a gallusness in it, you know. So uh, and the so there's rhythm with it. It's hard to explain. It's not just going dum dum dum. It's going. Now, if you listen to, I always say, our particular song came from, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it uh, what's the one with, uh, what do you call it? I'm Christ. I'm a dead Saturday night fever. Uh, the Bee Gees. Ah, uh, well, no, the actor, what's his name? John Travolta. <laughs> Aye. Well, what's the film he did with, what's the film he did with uh, the blonde the girl uh, from Australia? Right, 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 Greece, right. How did we get the Johns of in Greece? Oh, uh, because listen, I'm telling you the sound, right? <laughs> so it comes from, it's a mix, you take Greece and then you take Donna Summer, right? Is your love, 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 you know that one? Yeah. Right, so you go, dum 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 and uh, Republican flute bands. <laughs> yes. Fused, obviously, with, you know, Rebel. 
Yes, no, exactly. No, of course, the balance never done like that. But fundamentally, the other thing is we also did this, like, we also did jiggy things, like, we did what that, right? Which people won't do, maybe. And that's very Irish, the jig. You know, so, like, uh, Bill Black Drummer's a jig and things like that. But uh, it's a music book, but it's different. We play, we play them very much like jigs. I know a lot of people play them like shuffles, but that's a musical thing. But that's where the sound came from, I think. And w- yeah. when, when you started, Charlie, in, in you know, when when you come up with this, you say concept, right, of of the Blarneys and the sound you were going to. Was there anyone else doing anything like that at the time? Oh, did you just kind of were you just kind of the pioneers of that sound? No, you see, see, I, no, no, see, see, the most important people in the Glasgow Rebel scene, without any question. Was me and Billy from Coke Bridge, God rest him, who passed away there a few years ago, right? Me and Billy Davison. And he did the band with the most wonderful name in the world, the Timbuk Five. And Billy was a tenor and he sang high and he sang all the songs and he, he played the guitar and he and Derry trainers and you see him all over the place and he kept the music alive. And his presence and his singing was everything in Glasgow. And then the peat diggers came along, the two young t- t- twin boys, the peat diggers, and they would sing a few memorable songs, but they were quite nice. I mean, they were, lovely, they, they, were, they were great entertainers, but they weren't hardcore Republican, if you know what I mean, and all that. And then I suppose Charlie and the boys appeared around about the same time, but they were very Celtic. You know, we never played Celtic songs really for me, you know. After Grander, we did a few, but uh, um, so I'd say we were certainly the first that said uh, F this for a game of soldiers. Um, and we also wanted to take the music out of the wee pubs and we took ads out in the Sunday Mail and the papers and we sold tickets up the town and we felt we should, and we felt we should take our place properly. And the music should be, maybe shouldn't be underground in that way, if you follow me, you know. And uh, so I suppose we, 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 we were, we were, yes, we were the first probably, yes, with the drums and the bass and the dry, kind of driving it a bit, yes. And then, and then obviously there was there was ones that followed. There was a young era Hogue and then Shabine and, That's and, right. and right through to um, the Wakes now, who have That's right. you know, kind of kind of punky folky. Like so, they've yes. kind of, they've kind of gone the full uh, circle. And your influences, Charlie, and they and they they write their own songs too, which is the great thing you see. You see, it's important that the Irish community in Glasgow the music uh, write their own songs. You know. Uh, I know it's uh, if you if you're singing war songs and the war's over, you're kind of stuck a wee bit. If that's the only thing you've got, but uh, uh, I think they have to. I would like to see more songs uh, being written in Glasgow. You know. Yeah, and it, it, like songwriting is, I suppose, it, it, it's a gift, and um, I think. The Wakes have definitely carried on from the Grand Ovas mm-hmm. the Selling Man album, which, um, and again, the Wakes, you know, it, it's strange, Charlie, you know, if you put the Wakes on on a bus or you put the Grand Ovas Selling Man album, unless, mm-hmm. unless it's a certain bus, the young the young crew are just going, oh, I get, they want, the, they, they want Martin down Sackville Street or they want, <laughs> you know, Air Oak Life and the Brazen Head. Oh, listen, see, the, thing, the, the whole thing is, Mullis, the most popular books in the world are shit. Right. The most uh, the most popular films in the world are shite, right? Uh, if you the most popular podcasts in the world most certainly will be shite, you know, but uh, <laughs> Thank uh, God for uh, the most popular. Uh, 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 so, uh, I know that uh, I know that if you try and be a bit thoughtful and be a little bit creative and a little bit tasteful and all of that and take steps in that direction. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people who don't like it, man, but, you know, they, they, you know it's, uh, it's, so you're absolutely right. But, uh, but that's, I, I believe there's a few people that uh, would listen to other stuff, you know. We had um, Declan McLaughlin, and um, we played a with his new album on the podcast I don't know if you've heard Declan it's absolutely brilliant Charlie and I'd imagine it's right up, right up your street Declan Declan's the one now that 
uh, I can't wait to go and see. And it's funny, we played them, and, and one of the one it was Hilly the contact and says, Where do you get that? Where do you get that album? I want to buy that CD. And he bought it, and then obviously arrived a few days later. And straight away, he's on to me. This is magic. So, you know, with this lockdown, this, this album has come out, and it's been, it's been one of the good stories of the lockdown. <laughs> There hasn't been too many, Charlie, and definitely check out Declan McLaughlin. And what we've done was, we, Ronan, the, the producer of the show, was a musician. And obviously his livelihood has been taken away from him. And he, he's, a, he's a music teacher as well. He's done his master's in music technology. But he can walk in nothing that he, he's qualified to walk in. Yes, yes. Um, so I was lucky enough to get to talk him into producing the podcast. And that. But he suggested, why don't we, we play out with a song? And we started to play out, and it's not just Celtic music or Irish music. We approached Declan, and Declan's given us two songs, and you've given us a couple. And then people contact you and say, Look, will, will you play out my song? And we'll give them, and it, it's in the podcast description so people can link in and buy their album. So, and it, but it's funny, it wouldn't have come from me. It actually come because Ronan's a musician. No, and it, 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 that's kind of where, and he's he's the one that's kind of living the, living the, you know, my life's been just like, it's funny the other day I had, you know, the politicians are, are saying, oh, you know, oh, well, with you, we know what you're going through. But they don't because their, their livelihood hasn't been affected. But yet the livelihood... Uh, also, also, the, uh, the same thing, the music and the arts, right? When they talk about music and the arts and supporting them in these times, it's funny, see, when they talk about musicians, for example, they, they, they always talk about uh, 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 national opera or something. They never talk about pop musicians, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if they talk about artists, it's always a, it's, it's always a high art, isn't it? Do you know that way? You, know, you, you, you never. Uh, uh, um, there's thousands of people. It's, it's to me like it's like most footballers earn nothing, don't they? And we only talk about the you know the ones at the top and what have you. Well, music, tons and tons of people have been affected by this. And but when they talk about supporting the arts and music, they never actually talk about giving a couple of bob or anything to the. I mean, musicians who can't. The whole economy is people don't get signed checks and chips and all that in the pub music game. You just turn up, you play, and you get your money. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so you, you can't go along and get your payments and what have you and all this. You know. And it's like down here, particularly in Kerry, the music industry is hugely important to tourism and uh, people playing in all the bars and all the pubs. And under normal circumstances, if that wasn't occurring, the people wouldn't come. Yeah. They come here and they buy all the pottery and they buy this and stay in hotels and they go to the fancy restaurants. And all the money um, uh, uh, goes into that class uh, 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 of tourism, you know? But actually, in many ways, it's the guys with the fiddles and the guitars that are bringing the people there in the first place, you know, uh, and uh, uh, they've been disregarded, you know. So it's tough. Yeah, and it's it's funny, Charlie, you speak about the arts. Um, we have a fabulous arts centre here and a fabulous uh, small theatre. And every time I go to Buka for a spoken word event um, <laughs> or someone with an acoustic guitar, it's always booked out. And even when it's not booked out, it's booked out, it's, it's booked out for rehearsals. And I said it to, to a musician friend of mine, and uh, he says, well, he says, maybe you should start to learn to fire or juggle, he says, because maybe they don't think that your art is an art. No, 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 it's like, it's like down here they have all tons, uh, tons of art things and cultural things and all that, right, you know, and other voices and all that, you know, and, right. And uh, I remember a few years ago, and this, and this all, uh, Thinking, why couldn't they finish off the event with having Joe Dolan on in the dance hall and let everybody have a good time for a change, you know, right? Because Joe was alive then, God rest him, right? But, what, but of course, Joe Dolan didn't pass the artistic test, you know, like right? the wrong class, wrong culture, wrong songs, you know. The, uh, uh, but if, if he'd been singing uh, 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 opera in Irish or something, he'd have been on the telly, you know. But, uh, so there's a great, uh, there's a great prejudice against, isn't it, uh, proletarian culture? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 hundred percent. The amount of doors that's been closed, you know, and stuff I do over the years, and it, 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 even, even as a DJ, you know, playing soul and reggae and ska. Back, back in, in, in like when I was trying to get going in the eighties and the nineties, I remember walking into a nightclub and I saying to the owner, I says, "Look, I says, would you give us once a month and I, I'll play this music, you know, because it was, it was just commercial pop they were playing in it." And he says, he said, "Look around, the place was packed." He says, 
why would I do that? You know, I said, because people will get bored. And he laughed at me, you know. That mm. is no clothes now. You know, and, and, and I'm still DJing. So maybe there was some truth in, in, in what I was saying. But that's that's enough of the, me DJing and, and um, musicians and all that. Right, from listening to your music, Charlie, especially the Grand, there was a Celtic Man album. I keep banging on about it, but I don't know the album. I get a mental picture painted. That Celtic is much more than 90 minutes to you. It's much, you know, you went there as a kid, seeing that, you know... You, you weren't alone. But I always find when I speak to Charlie yourself and, and, and other people that Shelley is much bigger than the players that take to the... Okay, aye, 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 aye. Than this season. And- well, no, there's no question about it. You see, um, <laughs> we needed something. We needed something to hang a hat on. We needed to, something to be in Celtic was and is that, you know, it really is. Uh, um, and I, I, Celtic means much more to me than I probably did than I think it does. If you, if you know what I mean, uh, uh, and you're right. And I, uh, the results, like I said, everybody, old women, old men, people, no, don't bother. They still want Celtic. They still follow Celtic. They want Celtic to do well, you know. And it, it, they're proud of Celtic. And that's the thing. They're proud. You see, I remember when I was remember when Christian Wick came to Glasgow, I was so proud that an Irishman came and years and years ago, you know, he was first becoming a star and he played in the Pavilion Theatre. And I was so proud that uh, this Irishman had came to Glasgow and uh, had shown what we were able, what we were capable of and had delighted people. And I actually wrote him a letter called Freddie Anderson, the poet from Monaghan, gave me Christie's address and I wrote a letter to Christie years ago just saying, just to let you know, Christie, um, you made me and my family feel so proud, you know, um, when he turned up from Glasgow and it was, made us feel great. And he wrote, he wrote back a lovely letter and all that as well, you know. But it's the same as Celtic makes you proud. You see, we are a colonial people. We have been kept down. We have low self-esteem. We crave approval. Uh, you know, uh, that's in our DNA. Hopefully, over the time, we'll be able to sort that out. But it means so much to us um, uh, to um, see ourselves achieving things, if you know what I mean. And Celtic is, is like Christian Ward, if you follow me. Celtic, that big that stadium, that really is a monument. To, to the Irish in Glasgow, you know, and, and it makes us proud. And Charlie, why do you think that um, like when we were kids growing up that we heard about, you know, my dad worked in London, so obviously we heard about the London Irish and we, we hear about the American Irish. But why do you think that, you know, the, the big diaspora in Glasgow, the, the, why, why did I not hear about the Glasgow Irish when, when I was in school growing up? And nobody, because you see, nobody wanted you to hear about the Glasgow Irish because the Glasgow Irish didn't have a rugby club. Right. The Glasgow Irish were a hundred percent proletarian, working class, uh, poor people. Really, they, for the most part, uh, there were people who naturally always, from the beginning of partition, sided with the six counties. Always, they um, they were told by the Scottish establishment that they, they were not Irish and to stop being plastic paddies. And whenever they tried to act Scottish, they were told to behave themselves, that they weren't Scottish, they were just paddies. They were kept down. Nowhere in the world were the Irish treated worse, I believe, than in Scotland. Which, yeah, because the history books... It tells us about the Irish that travel around the world, but it was it's only when it's only when I started going to Glasgow that I realised that I realised how big the Irish community was. So more people went to more people went to Glasgow had the population anywhere else in the world. The Irish and they, I mean it's, I mean, it's so, it wasn't until the late nineties that the Irish in Scotland achieved economic parity with with the, the Scots. Wow. You know, uh, uh, the, uh, you see a lot of people in. As you know, in Ireland, they all you know, they, they say to me, they hear the accent, of course, and <clears throat> they presume I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Scottish. And they start talking about us Celtic soul brothers, you know, like, uh, you know, um, like, uh, um, they'll say, you know, um, yeah, uh, 
uh, Irish and Scots, Ireland and Scots, Ireland and Scotland, same thing. Oh, we hate the English and all that stuff, you know. Right? Ireland and Scotland and Scotland, they're just the same, you know. And then I'd say, right, well, why Scotland's still occupying six counties in our country, in Ireland, you know? There was no thinking about that, you know, right? But uh, exactly, as you see, yes, Britain's occupying six counties here. That's Scotland and England, you know? They're occupying six counties here. What's this Celtic brother stuff? And the other thing, if the SNP had said years ago, we are calling on the sons of Scotland to desist from serving the British Army in the six counties, right? I would have had a big soul tire out the window and I would be wearing a kilt and I would be voting the SNP, but they didn't, you know? Uh, so I the Scot- Scottish people, had a, the Irish people had a terrible time in Scotland. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I'd hate to sound, like I wrote a song about uh, <clears throat> the young men who came in the 50s, about my father, father's generation, and if I try to remember the verse, that's, that there's some verse that says, uh, what was it, uh, uh, something about, uh, they met fine Scottish people, men and women aplenty, who welcomed them warmly, who opened their eyes to a world free from priests and blind superstition, to the world of ideas, the world of the mind. But they also met hatred, blind naked hatred, for to rule over empire you first must divide, a hatred of Ireland, our sons and our daughters, a bitter orange hatred distilled on the Clyde. Right? There are absolutely wonderful people in Scotland. I got my education from Scottish Protestants who were socialists and Marxists. Uh, wonderful, wonderful people. I, I learned so much from them. Uh, um, so I, I, I would never want anybody to think I was painting paint Scottish people with one brush, if you know what I mean. But there was also the dominant feeling was terrible, terrible bigotry and uh, the, the police, the judiciary were all Masonic. Uh, the, uh, things were really, really bad and I don't think we should ever forget that, you know? Yeah, and you sang a couple of verses there of a song about when, when your dad arrived in, in Glasgow. Um, what's your favourite songs, Charlie, that you've written or performed or... Um, Done your own version of the song. What's your favourite to listen to, and what and what's your favourite um, to perform? And as well as that, which which is, which is the one you're you're most proud of of writing? I don't know. But, uh, I don't know. Like it's hard to say. But uh, there's songs that I haven't recorded yet. Really, you see, I've written songs about the Kirkintilloch disaster in uh, Ackle Island, the, and I've written song about Charlie Carrigan, the Irish volunteer from Glasgow, and I've written songs about Michael Lahan, the Kerry man who went and fought in the French, Spon- sorry, the Spanish Civil War. For, uh, he, tro- he went three times, he crossed over and fought, and I've written songs about Father Michael Flanagan, uh, the Sinn Féin priest, and I've written, so most of the songs that I would have an affection for haven't been recorded yet. And have you any plans to record them, Charlie? Because now you're getting excited. <laughs> no, I mean, I've, got, I've got to be 25 with them, to be honest. And one of them is John McLean and, um, and then songs that aren't like, necessarily political. But uh, um, yes, I have plans to record them. And, uh, great news. Because I, I enjoy writing songs more than singing them and playing them, if you know what I mean. Really? Aye. It's great fun, aye. Yeah. It's... Uh, I, I recommend it to anybody. It's 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 good fun, you know. Uh, 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 so that's all it is. I like doing it, you know. And I've got a song about uh, um, uh, Thomas Ash, of course, from down here in uh, uh, Lisbon outside Dingle. And um, uh, there's a song I got asked to write a song about a, a local um, boy who was killed here by the Free Staters, just down a couple of hundred yards down the road from us and uh, uh, Thomas Sullivan and uh, things like that so uh, I, I, I need to get busy here <laughs> Into the car, you know? Listen, listen, you see, the thing is, if we always say to people, see whatever ambition or drive you have in your energy, come to live in West Kerry and leave it all behind. <laughs> leave it all. <laughs> it, 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 
<laughs> when she just come here, you're like, fuck it, doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't, I mean, wait, well, who cares? You know? <laughs> we, we, we care, Charlie, because we love Charlie there. I love me music and I love it. Uh, and I, yeah. I love a song that has some history in it. I love a song that has deals with social issues. I, I love a song. I, I love a song of a Celtic, and, uh-huh. and I love a song I can sing in a pub because <laughs> because I don't. I wasn't blessed with a voice to sing. Although I come, it's funny. I come from a very musical family. Um, you, I've you know all my cousins and uh-huh. you know, they're all. Some of them are, one of them is quite famous as well. He's done really well for himself. <laughs> Stephen's done really well for himself and he, he records and he's been to Nashville and he's been to all these places. And when, when we go to funerals or weddings and we get talking, you know, I'll be the one in the corner that won't be getting up to sing a song out there. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, me, me, back to me, grand, me grandfather was, uh, you know, played brass in the bands and that. But anyway, right, so maybe that's about where I like music. That's it. I have a time machine. I always polish it up when I have a podcast guest on and I want you to go back in my imaginary time machine as I said I take all the guests back I want you to climb on board and I want you to go back to a time or a game or a gig back in Glasgow game a game or a gig yeah just bring me back somewhere take me Wait, one place one place ah look 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 we're right. not in any hurry so if you want to stop right. in a few places I'll go for one night football right most enjoyable match ever right Without question, 1980, because I was 25, 25 is a great age to enjoy football, right? And it was Celtic playing Real Madrid, uh, 67,000 people looking for tickets, and uh, nobody could get them. And Louise's brother worked in Celtic Park, and Joe Dock was the groundsman at the time. So we get in. Into the, 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 the south stand, the stand, the stand, but with no seats, but we get in and we, we just sat there on the steps. We just sat there on the, on the, on the, the, the steps. It seems strange, but we did. But of course, Celtic 1 2 1 and Johnny Doyle, the most magnificent goal, jumping up to the most wonderful height, the light shining, right? And in those days, you were allowed to bring things into Celtic Park, like cans of beer. And Maggins of whiskey, and we had uh, plenty of tobacco because you could smoke at that time. And also, Louise's brother, God rest him, had a wee lump of Nepalese temple ball. So uh, it was one of <laughs> it was one of the most enjoyable matches. See, it's all about enjoyment, isn't it? You know. So that. That from, and it was a nice, lovely, dry, wonderful night. So that was uh, my favourite match of all time. <laughs> Uh, it's funny I remember in Ibrox one time um, when, when we'd returned from Amsterdam after playing Ajax and I remember um, a picture of myself and my friend came on uh, Sky Sports from a half time now I think we were only being about one nil a half time and when I got home from the game everyone said you just looked very happy for a team that was being beaten you know and I said well that's, that, that's the very last of Amsterdam exactly, exactly. Uh, and I tell you one thing it, it is the pain but, but no, no, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to jump you in the, in the time machine with you because I want you to take me back to when you recorded that album in the main fiddler and two full buses left to leave with General Hillman. Um, and that album was recorded. And then the album, it goes everywhere. If I'm thinking back, it was probably released, Charlie, nearly 20 years ago, wasn't it? You know, the, thing, the interesting thing about when, that was, when it was recorded, it was recorded the very weekend, Easter weekend of the Good Friday Agreement. So how many years are we going back? 98. Yeah, because my son was born in 99 and as a child, the album would be playing and he would be he would be dancing on the bed. You know, a, a, a little kid and he, 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 whatever was in the beat of the music, because uh, he certainly wasn't, he certainly was political. <laughs> <laughs> you see the thing about that, sorry, so, no, to see the thing about that was, for me, it was hugely important, and then Mark brings his own, uh, 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 but uh, uh, it was so hugely important for me that the music we played was uh, that the crowd in the main fiddler in Dublin responded exactly the same way as the crowds in Glasgow. There was no cultural difference between the people whatsoever. Yeah, if you know what I mean, it wasn't like 
We doing the pre pre and doubling a few times, but very quickly it became clear. We started in the bag it in and all of that. It became absolutely clear that the rhythm and the, the way of playing was in tune with the people, the, the, the Dublin audience, without question. And the chance, that, because it, it was a ritual, it was like a mass, if you follow me, you know, it was a ritual and it led somewhere and the whole thing, the, the night, and people knew the, the ritual. And uh, it was most uh, satisfying to find that uh, whether it's Belfast, Dublin or Glasgow, the people are the exact same, you know. I think, Charlie, it could be Dublin was the last time I think I saw you perform live with the band. Um, mm. I, I know you. I, I know you were down in the league, and I know you played. I, I, I think you played at our first dinner dance, which was about two thousand and three, so the year of Seville. That and, and maybe the dinner dance was probably the last time um, a seniors perform live. Which brings me on to your drummer, Paul. Paul, Hi. Paul stayed with me at the Flack Yole. The Flack Yole was was been happening in Drada and he couldn't get accommodation. And I, I've got a solution, Paul. Well, it, it two of you know he, he was bringing the kids over, his man and, and his his lovely wife, and they were coming. And he he was getting somewhere maybe in Dublin. That was the nearest he could get because everywhere was and the hotels were charging you know fast. And, uh-huh. So I said, Paul, I might have a solution. Now, without telling my wife and son, I told them they were all moving out for the night because we've only got a two-bedroom house. So I said, you're all moving out for the night. You're going to your mum's. You're going here. And I, so I moved back into my mum's for, I think, two nights. And Paul moved in and it was brilliant. He came down and, and one of the girls took out the flu. So we had a private. We got a private gig in the sitting room. And it was lovely. And I think she went down to I don't, maybe get second. I'm not sure if she won, but she was definitely, you know, placed. But myself and Paul managed to get out for a couple of points because I didn't realise what the flower was. I just thought it was a big session, whereas it's not. You know, these kids are competing. So he, he you know, if you've got two kids competing, they're competing on different. If, if they go through to perform in the bigger venues, and so we, 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 on the Saturday afternoon, we got a couple of points together, and uh, I said to Paul, you know, it's about time. It's about time we got the Blarneys back together. <laughs> so we had a gig, and we actually started talking, and he was saying, you know. So maybe if Mark Bork's listening, because these albums are out on Spotify and there's a new audience out there, you know, my son has never experienced a Blaney Pilgrims gig. So maybe it's about time when this show of a lockdown is over and the coronavirus has fucked off. Maybe the Blaney Pilgrims will get back together and give us one of them nights, Charlie. I don't listen. Even Paul's not young anymore. <laughs> never, no, no, never, never mind me, but Paul, Paul's an absolutely great lad, a fantastic lad, right? And see when we recorded that, Gander was a Celtic man. We went to Dunleary, not at Black Rock, to this new studio above a barber's. And, but they, they couldn't record the drums right there, so we went over to a studio in Sutton and went over for one session and Paul had to record all of the drum tracks that night, all the drum tracks, right? Every single one, 11 drum tracks. So he puts the headphones on and all he's getting is a kind of click, bing, 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 or something, right? But he's to keep in mind what's going on and Paul has to play all the drums straight off for 11 tracks, right? And he'd been off the fags for a good while. <laughs> and he went into the he went into the V room or into his booth, his own booth, his headphones and the drum kit. And of course when he kicked off, we were looking through the window like big thumbs up and well done, Paul, and this is great. And after a while we we're smoking and drinking coffee and playing games and more brother. But he came out at the end of it all, and of course the first thing he did was meant for a fag. <laughs> because but he was he done done he done a great drumming job on that album going together, you know. Uh, and he's a, just a great fella, Paul. Yeah, I think uh, he plays a couple of instruments, doesn't he? He's been brought oh, he plays I had a flute and a whistle and I I I accordion and um I've that accordion, that's right. That's right, I I wouldn't say I'm jealous of him, but I do hate <laughs> people who have too much talent. <laughs> <laughs> what we, we idealised you should the best thing for a band to do is to try to lower the average age you know uh, so uh, get 
some of those more like your child's age, you know, and then uh, uh, so that, that's when we brought in Paul and Sean, and that was to try and that was me trying to lower the age. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, but uh, Charlie, look, I'm going to be annoying Mark Book now to get the, the, the get this back together when all this is over. Charlie, it's been um, it's been lovely for all the listeners who thought they were getting a Neil Lennon special. I know, I know, I know. Um, we, 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 we will leave that to the other because I'd say every other podcast this week I'll be talking to Neil Lennon. So Aye. I'm just delighted I could talk Charlie Feely and bring back some memories for the listeners who would have enjoyed so many nights and so many days <laughs> listen to the Blarneys and I think even the younger listeners will, will, will remember the songs they may not remember the gigs but I'm sure they heard the songs in their houses or on, on buses as they travelled <laughs> as Kieran Kenny to say in Dave Park over land and sea that's right and to let us into your Celtic soul has been absolutely brilliant it's you know it's probably been the good to 20 years since we've had a conversation like this yes. um, and just to get your Get your little story down. It is amazing. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been fun. It's been good fun, hasn't it? It's... It has indeed. Yeah, and we, we've had um, we've had a little laugh along the way, and I hope the listeners. That's right. I hope so. And here, Charlie, just before you go, um, just something you told me yesterday when we when I was lining up the interview. You told me that your mum and your wife's mum have never been to see Celtic, but yeah, every Saturday evening. They looked for the score, isn't that? Well, listen, no, you see, that's the whole thing because it is a thing. It is, uh, I, know, I, I know the word community is that's kind of stupid word and all that, but the point is, it is everybody, but everybody cares, you know. And my mother lived in uh, uh, and father, at the end, they lived in Aikenhead Road, uh, one of the roads on the way up to Hamden, down at Paul Medi. And remember the year when Celtic were at Hamden? Yes. You know, so. so Every Saturday or once a fortnight, everybody would be passing her window, you know. And I'd be phoning her from here in Ireland. And she used to say to me, she'd say, I saw them, I saw them all passing today on the way up to Hamden. It was lovely. Right. And this is the thing is it is lovely. It, it can Celtic can be a lovely, lovely, safe thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I know. I know that there are sometimes elements that uh, challenge that, you know, or maybe. But to, to me, we shouldn't lose just how lovely those green and white hoops and the fans can be. You know what I mean? And and, her, and the reason why they're the same, it really, really matters. It really, really matters about Celtic, you know. And do you know the way there's people that will listen to Clyde Super Score more every night and not watch a match? I mean, years ago, nobody saw matches. You know, it was all the radio and reading papers, wasn't it? You know, uh, for lots of people. And it didn't stop you following what's going on, you know. Uh, I think people really do care. Oh, definitely, yeah. And even, like... um my mum and law Bernie, and you know, she'll always, say, she'll always say, you know, oh, I was I was cheering for you the other night, you know, and the, when we were in the telly, you know, if I was at the match, and mum and dad are the same, you know, I go and visit them, and like they'll be saying, my dad will, you know, he'll only he'll only talk about when we lose, mum will talk about when we win, and it'll all be from the paper, they won't have seen the game, it'll all be so, uh, yeah, it is, it is lovely. So, Charlie, I'll give you the final award, right? What song are we going to play yet yeah, from Grand Over the Celtic Man? Um, well, the song I wrote for the Celtic fans who came in the nineties to Glasgow when Saturday comes around. We will play that, Charlie. But we did play it before. But yeah, it's. it's... Oh, they will listen in, and the fans are saying, "Play then." Right. Well, we haven't played that, so we play. We play that for our friends in Hamburg. Yes. Yes. Charlie, God bless you, and um, I look forward to hearing this new album. I look forward to seeing his live again. And you know, this lockdown won't go on forever. And we'll maybe, maybe we'll <laughs> pull it up with the camera and the, and the recording gear and record you down in Kerry. Right. All the best, Mullish. Thank you very much. Great to catch up with Charlie, and I suppose relive a few great nights at gigs and some lovely memories are flooding back of those many, many hours spent on buses with good people when the soundtrack was the Blarney Pilgrims. Or the famous show that would come from the back of the bus. Hey driver, get the rebs on. More than 90 minutes, issue 113 is still available, the print edition and the digital download. 
You can visit the website sallyfanson.com and you can click into the link and order them. There's less than 10 copies left, so thanks very much for everyone who bought the fanzine with no match day sales. There would be no print edition without your continued support. So thanks again as we start work next week on issue 114. As always, thanks to Ronan McQuillan for producing the show and to the boys for sponsoring this episode. Your support is much appreciated and remember, 20 is plenty. If you like what we're doing with the podcast and the fanzine and you would like to support us, you can do so by visiting celticfanzine.com where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a pint. Don't forget to visit our website for articles and news on all things Celtic and Celtic fan related. And you can also sign up for our newsletter, which we've finally got round to, but I think we missed out again this week. But I promise I will get another one out. Please download our app, it's free, and you'll have access to all podcasts, articles, daily news, video and info on upcoming events, if we ever get to do them, the fanzine and our online shop, all at the touch of a button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are now available across all platforms, so hit that subscribe or follow button, never miss an episode, and leave a five-star review. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so give us a follow. Details are all in the podcast description. And we've started to release some pocket-sized podcasts, which we're calling the Celtic Soul Shorts on social media, which are snippets of conversations we've had with guests. We kicked off this week with Tommy Johnson talking about all the managers he played under at Celtic, which is six in total. And please, folks, all the podcasts are now available on our YouTube channel, Celtic Fans and TV. But please subscribe, because as lockdown continues, we are going to put some content out separate from the podcasts. We bought some equipment to create content in the summer and we were hoping to actually get out in the company of fans to create some content and get some interviews and some conversations recorded. But look, we're looking into another six weeks here of lockdown and we might as well get some practice in and get some half-decent content out. So, as I said, subscribe to the YouTube channel. or whatever. I'm not really sure what you do, but press a button or a bell or whatever and you'll get updates. Once again, folks, if your business is Celtic-minded or your Celtic supporters club would like to sponsor the podcast or your rich uncle or auntie have a few bob and they want to give it to us, we'd be more than happy to take it for a sponsor. Just email us at info at CelticFanzine.com for more or you can contact us through the website or message us on social media. If you enjoyed the conversation with today's guest, can I recommend listening back to episode 47 when Mark Bork chatted to us. Mark, of course, was the man who brought the Blandley Pilgrims to Ireland. Also, Adrian Hillman spoke to us back in episode 39. Hilly promoted the boys many times in Ireland as well. And Tommy Sheridan opened up his Celtic soul to us in episode 24. It's Aberdeen at Celtic Park this Saturday as John Kennedy takes charge of Celtic for the first time. It's normally a red eye fly for me, followed by a fish supper for breakfast and an early bus for so many fans en route to paradise. After me, fish supper for breakfast. I'd head to Malone's for Celtic AM, a few beers, a pint of bottle at the stadium, bump into plenty of familiar faces on Paradise Way, check in with the Celtic grandas at the pool office and get some words of wisdom before checking into Celtic Park. Great days, folks, which seem closer now with the vaccine in play. But for the moment, I can only dream from the sofa. For me, it's another three o'clock when Saturday comes around on the sofa with my virtual season book viewing, I suppose it's been described as a shit show of a season but hopefully it improves on Saturday each episode we like to lend our support to musicians, performers and songwriters who've been hit the hardest by the lockdown restrictions, no gigs and no venues and no singing at people's doors send your material and we will give you a plug and play out of each show so folks, thanks for listening thanks for supporting us, stay safe keep the faith and this week we play out our guest Charlie and his chosen song from the Blaney Pilgrims Grander Was a Celtic Man album, The Fans of St. Pauli, which is now available on Spotify for you to download and enjoy in your kitchen and you crack open a can on Saturday night. Oh, it's hard when you can get a job in the place where you belong. When you're forced to leave your family the place where you were born I left Glasgow town three years ago to go to Germany got a good job there in Hamburg town in a place called St. Pauli 
How the very first night I landed, boys, I was a lonely man. So I bade goodbye to my hotel room and I made for the Reaper Band. By a little square I found the bar and I went in for a beer. And the scene that I did witness there to fill. When I said I am a Celtic man, they slapped me on the back. For they kept a place for Celtic deep within their hearts. Before the night was over, the arrangements were complete. I had a squad of friends and a darling girl and a brand new. Well, the jukebox played the Dubliners, and the crowd all sang along. And each boy and girl in that Hamburg bar knew the words of every song. They most graciously invited me to join their company. So I spent that night. The next three years with the fans of San Pauli. If you're ever in San Pauli, boys, be sure to catch a game. Their supporters can vouch that they're insane. And as to their opinions, well, they'll leave you in no doubt. As they wave their Celtic scarves on high to the chant of Nazi trials. Well, the jukebox played the Dubliners and the crowd. Join their company. So I spent that night and the next three years with the fans of San Pauli. Well, I'll soon be home in Glasgow, boys. Back where I belong. And once more, I'll stand at Celtic Park and I'll sing a Celtic song. But I know my thoughts will oft times fly across the great North Sea, for I'll keep a place within my heart for the fans of San Pauli. Well, the jukebox played the Dubliners, and the crowd all sang along, and each boy. Join their company.